Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the United States State Department. My name is Allison Peters. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for our Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. I would like to welcome everyone to our open session with DPRK Human Rights Survivors. It is an honor to be here with you all today. A bit of housekeeping at the top. We will have simultaneous translation available for all, English on one channel and Korean on the other. And you can find the headsets in front of you. And with that, I'm honored to open our open session with introductory remarks by our Deputy Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell, who will lead us off today. Deputy Secretary. Thank you very much, Des Peters. And let me just take a moment to most warmly welcome all the people that are here who've joined us. Uh, and we are joined together, frankly, to hear testimony. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do, to offer testimony, to have the burden of being a voice for the voiceless. Uh, it takes enormous courage. It takes tremendous personal determination. And so when we say that it is an honor for us to host you here, uh, we are not exaggerating. It is an honor for us to be with you. The fact that you would share with us means the world to us. So we're incredibly grateful that you are here. And so more than anything else, I want you to know that friends from the ROK government, from the United States government, from the Japanese government, we are in awe of your courage and your determination and to make sure that we leave uh, today better informed uh, about how we can assist uh, the communities in North Korea that seek a better world. I do want to underscore that, that we've committed uh, among our three governments to take a number of steps that we think will increase access to information. We are working closely with the technology communities. We believe there are things that we can do to ensure that more information penetrates in an increasingly closed system. And we also want to do what we can to help highlight the stories of North Korean uh, escapees and defectors who have made a life in either uh, the United States or the ROK or Japan or elsewhere. And we're going to take that challenge on together. I do want to underscore that we are likely heading into an increasingly challenging period. And this is something that we must keep in mind. As we arrived in the meeting today, we are buffeted by reports that North Korea has decided to step up its support for Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Now, the full manifestations of that beyond weaponry, possible personnel, we're tracking closely. But I think we need to recognize that this is going to be a grave challenge. It creates some opportunities for us to expand our work, but at the same time, it is an ominous new development with respect to global politics. Um, I do want to just take a moment, if I can, to thank a few people. Minister Kim has been a driving force um, in the Korean government. He is insisting on ensuring that groups of countries that are like-minded work together on this common problem. Uh, personally, I am inspired by Das Peters. I'm particularly inspired by uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, who's been so uh, effective. Julie, could I ask you to just stand up and we could just say thank you to you, please. All right. So today we've agreed that we're going to announce and launch a new human rights action group among our countries to be able to track and work and again work on common practices. I do want to just underscore also as we conclude, we are approaching uh, transitions in many of our key governments. We have uh, elections in, uh, in Japan, we have elections in the United States. I want to underscore the fundamental bipartisan nature 
of our commitment to these issues that are enduring, that animate us, and that bring us together. Um, it is, again, such an honor to be able to be with you all, to be able to witness uh, your stories, your courage, your assistance in dealing with one of the most challenging and difficult issues today on the global scene. So I want to, again, thank everyone. Also thank other countries who are like-minded that want to join us. You honor us, again, by being with us today. Thank you very much for your support, both today but historically as well. So again, welcome uh, to the State Department. I look forward to further discussions, and I look forward to listening actively to the views and the experience and the testimony of the people that have joined us today. Thank you, Des Peters. Thank you very much, Deputy Secretary Campbell. The Deputy Secretary has outlined a number of joint commitments our governments have made here today in our trilateral meeting, and we are very honored and grateful to be joined by Minister Kim of the Ministry of Unification from the Republic of Korea to give opening remarks today and share the views and perspectives from our friends and partners in the Republic of Korea. Minister Kim. Thank you. Distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, uh, first I want to express my deep respect and gratitude uh, to the witnesses here today uh, for their courage in speaking up on behalf of the North Korean people and the human rights victims who continue to suffer from grave human rights abuses at this very moment. I want to also thank Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell for his opening remarks and for organizing this important gathering. The stories we will hear today are heartbreaking account of destruction of human dignity. That is stories that are painful and difficult to listen to. Yet, they are truths we cannot afford to ignore and the facts that all of us must come to know. North Korea, North Korea remains one of the most closed of country in the world with external access severely limited. Therefore, the only way to accurately understand the human rights situation in North Korea is through the testimony of survivors. The voice of survivors who say the unvarnished truths about North Korean human rights have served as a powerful reminder to the international community of the seriousness of this issue, and they have fueled solidarity and action. Recently, North Korea has reinforced its physical isolation by building barriers near the demilitarized zone as part of its so-called fortification effort. Internally, the regime has passed repressive laws like the law on rejecting reactionary culture and ideology in an attempt to ex exert total control over the mind of its people. These physical and mental barriers reflect the regime's fear of people's longing for the free world a kind of Berlin Wall of North Korea. But we know from history how such walls eventually fall. No matter how high or strong the walls may seem, they cannot keep out the deep desire for freedom and unification in the heart of the North Korean people. Just as the Berlin Wall eventually crumbled and brought freedom to East Germany, the barrier erected by North Korean regime to suppress and control its people will, in the end, become remnant of a failed regime. During the Cold War, in front of the Berlin Wall, President John F. Kennedy famously declared, I am a Berliner. And President Reagan demanded to tear down this wall. Your courageous testimony today will create cracks in the North Korean version of the Berlin Wall 
and through these cracks, the light of hope will shine on the North Korean people. The more North Korean regime build higher walls of oppression and isolation to maintain its power, the more international community must come together to ensure the voice of freedom reach the North Korean people. I hope today's gathering serves as a moment for the international community to reaffirm its commitment to rectifying the wrongs of North Korean regime and to preventing such tragedies from happening again. The government of the Republic of Korea has never forgotten the sacrifices and the suffering of North Korean human rights victims, not even for a moment. We will continue to stand in solidarity with the international community to restore their right and dignity. Once again, I extend my deepest thanks to Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell and Ambassador Yamada Sigeo and all those involved in organizing this meaningful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Kim. We're grateful for our strong partnership with the Republic of Korea and equally grateful for our strong partnership with the government of Japan. We're honored to be joined by Ambassador Yamada of the Embassy of Japan in the United States, who I would welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the United States Sec uh, Deputy Secretary Campbell, for taking the initiative in organizing today's very important event. At the Trilateral Summit meeting uh, at Camp David in August last year, Japan, the United States, and the Republic of Korea committed ourselves to strengthening cooperation to promote the respect for human rights in North Korea, and reaffirmed a shared commitment to the immediate resolution of the issues of abductees, detainees, and unrepatriated prisoners of war. It is very important to demonstrate to the international community the cooperation among our three countries and also with the other like-minded countries on the issue of human rights in North Korea. Today, we will hear from panelists including North Korean escapees. We believe that it is important to deepen our understanding of the human rights situation and the reality of human rights violations in North Korea by listening to their uh, very courageous uh, uh, stories. With regard to our own abductions issue, the Japanese government has so far identified 17 people as Japanese abductees by the North Korean authorities. Five of them returned to Japan in 2002, but the remaining 12 have not yet been able to return home. In addition, there are many other cases where the possibility of abduction by North Korea cannot be ruled out. The Shiba cabinet has positioned uh, the abduction as the top priority issue for its administration. Just yesterday, Prime Minister Ishiba met with the families of the abductions and reiterated his determination to resolve the abductions issue. The Japanese government is demanding North Korea to ensure the safety of all abductees and their immediate return to Japan. Today, we have a video message from Mr. Yokota Tetsuya, Takuya. He is the younger brother of a Japanese abductee, Ms. Yokota Megumi, and he is the representative of the Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. Before his video message, I would like to briefly introduce what has happened to Ms. Yokota Megumi. In 1977, Ms. Yokota Megumi, then a 13-year-old first-year junior high school student, was abducted by North Korea on her way home 
from school. The families of abductees have been working to return their loved ones. Unfortunately, Mr. Yokota Shigeru, the father of Megumi and Takuya, passed away in 2020 without being reunited with Megumi. With the aging of abductees and their families, the abductions issue is a humanitarian, uh, uh, humanitarian issue and also time sensitive issue with no time to spare. On a personal note, I am the same age as Megumi. And when I look back on my life from the age of 13 up until now, it really was a long time. And when think, I think about Megumi's life and the hardship she had to endure in North Korea, it really breaks my heart. In order, not, in order to resolve not only the issue of Japanese abductees, but also the issue of abductees from the Republic of Korea, detainees, and um, repatriated POWs, it is important for Japan, the United States, and the Republic, the Republic of Korea to unite and also work with the international community. The Japanese government is determined to do so. And again, I very much look forward to learning from today's panelists and through discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Yamada, for those incredibly powerful and personal remarks. We're now going to start our panel discussion, which we are so fortunate to have moderated today by Damon Wilson, our friend and partner in our Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and the president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, an independent, nonprofit, grant-making foundation supporting freedom around the world. And as we kick off our panel, I want to underscore the points that our Deputy Secretary made, which is a sincere thank you to all of you for your bravery and strength in joining us today and being willing to tell your stories. So with that, I'll turn it over to Damon to move us forward. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with uh, our partners with whom we work in Common Cause. I want to begin by thanking Deputy Secretary Campbell, uh, Minister Kim, Ambassador Yamada, and Ambassador Turner um, for putting human rights at the center of this trilateral cooperation. Um, and most importantly, we want to welcome with us today those who will be providing testimony who have suffered at the hands of North Korean regime. Remarkable individuals we'll turn to in a minute. Um, this hearing does come at a critical time. As you heard the Deputy Secretary say, we're here as we're watching reports of North Korean troops entering battle, serving in the war in Ukraine on the front lines of supporting Russia's illegal invasion. And this is just a stark illustration. It's a manifestation of the challenge that we face that the Deputy Secretary warned about at a time that's tough because of a trend of autocrats cooperating together to dismantle democratic systems and democratic norms in an effort to protect, defend their repressive rule. I think the rise of this authoritarian cooperation, it necessitates a clear, strong response from democracies. At Ned, we like to say democratic renewal begins with democratic solidarity. And as autocrats work together, democracies must be working together. And that's what this is about. Seeing this powerful US, ROK, Japan trilateral cooperation coming together in innovative ways to promote fundamental freedom, safeguard human rights and democracy, collectively defend global democratic norms. Um, we've seen this manifest as Japan and the ROK have taken critical steps in adopting democracy as part of their national security strategies or overseas development. We've seen this in President Yoon's recently announced unification doctrine that puts freedom at the center, at the core of South Korea's approach to unification. But today we're here to shine a spotlight on the widespread and systematic human rights abuses in North Korea. The world's discussions of North Korea often focuses on nuclear threats, geopolitical tensions that are presented by the regime. But we must recognize that these threats flow from the premise that it's an authoritarian repressive regime at home and that essence drives this dangerous behavior internationally. And so a successful strategy of cooperation among these three democracies has to put human rights at the center. 
The decade-long daily suffering of millions of North Koreans, it can't be shrouded in silence in this hearing today with your testimonies. It aims to break that silence. Now, this builds on a remarkable record. Many of you I see in the audience were involved a decade ago with the United Nations Human Rights Council when it took a landmark decision to establish the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic Republic, uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Led by three remarkable distinguished champions of, of human rights, the commission undertook a monumental task of investigating and exposing the full extent of human rights violations in North Korea. And through rigorous investigation, testimonies, compiled one of the most comprehensive reports for the international community to date. And what was uncovered was horrifying, systemic, systematic torture, imprisonment, widespread sexual violence, forced labor, starvation, and forced disappearances, public executions as tools of the regime. It was almost beyond comprehension. And this year, we marked the 10th anniversary of this groundbreaking report but we have to face the sobering reality that despite international condemnation, the human rights situation in North Korea is still a crisis. The regime continues to operate with impunity. And so today, we're going to turn to hear the personal stories of North Korean survivors. And they're here to speak not as victims of the regime, but as powerful agents of change and accountability. Each story that you hear today, it brings us one step closer to the truth, to justice, to accountability, and it's our role to bear witness to these truths that must be spoken, heard, and remembered. So we begin by saying thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your commitment to speak up, to share the truths, and to speak out on these issues. So this is not just about exposing past wrongs. What we're working towards is how to end current atrocities and prevent future ones. The experiences that we're gonna talk about they demand our action. So with that, let me introduce our speakers. Our first panelist, Justin, a currently a Fulbright student studying uh, in international relations at, the, at Syracuse University. Having effect, defected in 2011 with his family, Justin aspires to pursue his PhD on East Asian security and work on US-North Korea relations. Born in 1972, our second panelist, Young Sun Kwan, is a survivor who has un endured unimaginable hardships in North Korea, including the devastating starvation in the 90s, the brutality of the labor camps, and drawing from her experience in North Korea and drive to help those who remain inside, Ms. Kwan founded the North Korean Human Rights Alliance and serves as its president. Born and raised in North Korea, Ling Sung Min is currently the director of the Korea Desk at the Human Rights Foundation. And before joining HRF, Lee managed and devised projects and organizations in South Korea, Canada, US, focused on improving human rights conditions and North Koreans' access to information. He's helping to change the narrative of the world's understanding of the power and energy of the North, young North Korean defector community today. And as Ambassador Yamada mentioned, at the end, we will see video testimony from Yokota Takuya, representative of the Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. It's the organization that represents the families of Japanese nationals abducted by North Korea decades ago. And as you heard some of the story from the ambassador. So let's begin, Justin, if we may, with you. Let's turn to you to offer your testimony, please. And I think you'll do this in Korean. Okay. A festival. I'd like to share my story that I went through in North Korea and what kind of human rights violations that I've gone through. And I'd like to thank everybody who have prepared this place. My name is Justin. As Damon has mentioned, I'm currently a Fulbright, I'm receiving Fulbright scholarship studying international relations at Syracuse University. I have defected North Korea in 2011 with my family. And in 2012, I, came, I arrived in South Korea. So my experience that I'm going to share today is a case, well, it's one of the main cases of human rights violations that I went through in North Korea. So in 2010, December, I was in North Korea. It was brutally cold. And then I was 
forced to work in a construction place where the Kim Jong-un has to use to drive his cars. And my schoolmate had to bring in stones to pave the road. So we had a big stones that we had to bring in. And then we had like a portion of the work that is designated for us. And then since I wanted to finish this work quickly, I wanted to bring these big stones to the road. But I was too young, I was too small. I was 14 years old. And that big stone that I have wanted to bring to the road actually broke my finger. And I lost a part of my finger. And then I rushed into my uh, hospital with my friends. But with, as we have arrived in the hospital, the doctor told me that there is no medicine that we can use to treat you. Therefore, you have to go to the market and bring the medicine by yourself. So I had no other choice but to return to home. And then we tried the bigger hospital. And the other doctor there was didn't even see my fingers. And they just told me that you have to cut off the entire finger. So I had choice of listening to the doctor's advice, but I haven't. Because there were some students who were wanting to uh, have some computers and play with the keyboard. And then what I thought was that I, once I cut off my finger, that I won't be able to play with the keyboards. So I told the doctor that I want to have a second thought about this, and then went and returned home. And a doctor in, our, in my neighborhood actually heard my story and came to me and said that he, he could treat me. And then I asked him whether I have to cut off my entire finger. And he told me that I actually don't have to cut off my finger. So he was really curious why, this, why the hospital told, told me that I have to cut off my entire finger. And he actually treated me for over six months. But the problem is that in order for me to get completely cured, I had to cut off some part of my bone. But I, we couldn't get painkiller. So the only option that we had was to try to do it without it, and he brought some like um, tools to cut off my my bone, and that was the year when I turned 15. So, so after, and after I cut off my bone, my wound started to heal. So basically, I had no other choice. When I even even when I was young, I was very loyal to North Korea. I wanted to become a warrior to protect the general. And that was my dream. But I found out that because of my family background, I could not be getting promoted when even I go to the military. And there were many, many people who repeatedly told me that I could only survive when I leave North Korea. And my parents told me that we wanted to go, they wanted to go to South Korea and asked me whether I want to go or not. And without any hesitation, I told them I wanted to go to Korea. And in 2012, I arrived in South Korea, and I received a lot of opportunities that was never been dreamed of when I was in North Korea. There was a lot of non-government organizations that provided me support with my education, and I was successfully be able to integrate into the South Korean society. And I studied political science at Yonsei University, and now, I'm having this Fulbright scholarship to study political science here in this state. One last thing that I want to say here, and then what I want to tell to North Korean people in North Korea, is that if you escape from North Korea, you will get an infinite amount of opportunity. And I want to tell everyone here that there are still 20 million people living in the North Korea that is still suffering like uh, like why I have I have suffered a decade ago. And there are a lot of people who have been enslaved by the North Korean regime. So before thinking about North Korean regime, please think about the North Korean people who are suffering under the regime. Thank you.
Justin, if I may, I'm gonna follow up. Justin's an example of a young North Korean who with just a few years in freedom flourishes, you thrive, and you talked about the opportunities. What would you like your peers in North Korea to know about life outside of North Korea? Maybe what were some of the, the differences that you were able to take advantage of in a life of freedom that you would want them to know about? Uh, when I was in North Korea, the only option that was given to me was to enroll to the military and become part of the Workers' Party, and that was my only dream. But when I left North Korea and came to, went to South Korea, there were numerous opportunities. And if you work hard, I could do what I wanted to do. And I want other people to know that. Thank you, Justin. Ms. Kwan, may we turn to you for your testimony, please? Good afternoon. So I, I was born in 1972 at South Hamgyong province, and my father used to work at the state security department. When I was 11, my mother passed away. And when my father was still alive, as he was working for the government, I did not know what poverty meant, because my father was loyal to the government. But the loyal father had, had an accident in 1994, and he passed away. And after my pa father passed away, I started to f learn that the territory and the country that I lived in was such a fearful place. So, and then my parents, who lived in North Korea, uh, could, could not leave anything for us after they passed away. Because when I, my father was there, I did not know anything about North Korea's reality. But after they passed away, poverty struck me, and we had to find a way to survive. And when I turned 25, I had to go to China, because I heard from people that I could make money when I go to China. But I was victimized by the human trafficking in China. So I was sold to a Korean Chinese who were living in North Korea. So I gave birth to a child, but it wasn't. But China was not a country that could protect us, even under that circumstance. When I was in China, I was forcibly repatriated back to North Korea four times, and then I defected again. So in 2013, that was my first defection to North Korea, and my then and then when I had my four-year-old daughter left at China. And when I went to, when I was supposed to repatriate back to North Korea, it was first time for me to, first time in five year, for me to return to my hometown, and realize that that place was a hell. My sister died because of starvation, and the remaining family members that I had there, were making their living out of the marketplaces, but they could not make enough money for them. And when I was repatriated to North Korea. So I wanted to hide all the money that I was bringing into North Korea. And then, and then I put all the money that I had in my some private places. But the state security department actually went, in, went into all the part of my body and then took money out of me. And it was a very inhumane thing. And then when we are sent back to North Korea, so the State Department officers basically put their fingers into my private places, and then they force us to jump a lot of times, so that the monies that I have in my money, in my body, inside my body, could um, pop out. So that was the first repatriation that I felt experienced. But I was able to successfully defect North Korea again. 
October that year. And even after I was able to defect, to North, defect from North Korea, I was again being captured and repatriated back to North Korea November that year. And then after, and then when I went back to North Korea, I bribed the State Department officers, and then defected again. And I thought that was a miserable life that I had in China. So I thought I could make my living and have a life when I go to South Korea. And then when I tried to go to South Korea, I was captured again and had been repatriated to North Korea. So when I was repatriated to North Korea for the third time, so Chinese officers in the past did not like ser searched me for the money. But the third time when I was repatriated, the, even the Chinese officers tried to take all everything that I have. So uh, the money that I had was still was taken away by the Chinese officers. So if you have if you bring money back to North Korea, the state security departments would have the female soldiers to to try to get money out of us and try to put fingers and hands inside my body. And then they like scream at us saying that why are you not listening to the party? So they constantly scream at us saying that you have to make give money, uh, give, uh, give like surrender everything that I have. And that, has, that was all done in front of all the male like officers that was in front of us. But I didn't know shame at that time, because the only thing that I was thinking at this time was that I wanted to make sure that I can keep this money. But there were some people who swallowed, swallowed a money, but the, the, all the officers there were just beating us all the time, like trying to take all the, everything that we had. And it was not a life that it, it wasn't really like a living. It was like a miserable tragedy. And after all this repatriation and defection, I was able to have my final defection in 2008. And that was my fourth defection from North Korea. And I arrived in South Korea in the February of 2009. When I, when I arrived in South Korea, I wanted to bring my uh, younger brothers and sisters from North Korea. And so I worked really hard in South Korea and sent all the money that I had to them. But when all this money was sent to them, the youngest in our family was caught while receiving this money. So my youngest sister was imprisoned because she was receiving money from me. And the, gov and the government found out. And she was tortured. And she was killed when she was 34. The money that I gave her made her be killed by the North Korean regime. And my father was loyal to this regime and this, con this territory. And then my sister had to go through this tragic event because of me. And she died, and she had a son, a two-year-old son. And when he turned six, I wanted to bring him to South Korea. And he was there at the Hessen city. But I found out that he was killed by 
by a thief. He was stabbed when he was six years old. So in North Korea, children have access to drugs. So this thief was going into this house. And when he wanted to get a drug, and then while he was like searching for drug, he killed three three kids. So how would you how would a person try to go search for drugs in places where the kids are in? That is the reality of North Korea. So even when there are drugs being supplied, there is no the regime doesn't do anything about it. And it, and even when the even when a crime is committed, if you have money and power, you can simply get away. All the human rights and all the concept of humanity have been has, dis has disappeared from North Korea. Even when we use the same language the regime is very different from what we have here. I hope my voice will be echoed. And, and have the North Korean regime. To be legally responsible. And that is why I, w I am here today. Because I've never known a vocabulary called human right. And there are still people in North Korea who don't know what human right is. And they're beaten up and being killed by the North Korean regime, even at this very moment. I hope everyone, everyone who's here in this room and every, everyone in the world will work together to fight for the people in North Korea. And I, I'm here to ask for your support. The people in North Korea don't even know what human right is. Please save them. So when, so I, Please help us to, for the regime to end and save those who are in North Korea. Under the, uh, under the idea of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing what are almost unspeakable horrors. It points to the resilience, the determination of those who are willing to bring their voice to testify to these atrocities. Thank you, Jung Sun. Let me turn to Sung Min. Sung Min, let me invite you to offer offer your testimony, please. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson. Uh, I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, the governments of the United States, Republic of Korea, and Japan um, for bringing us uh, all together on this panel. And uh, this is, uh, um, just reminds me once again that um, the North Korea, the, my uh, birth country, uh, the country that does now the, even the concept of the human rights, uh, Ms. Kwan's uh, story that reminds me of my uncle my uncle was also beaten to death in prison uh, about three years ago uh, for simply, um, he tried to talk to uh, my mom. My mom is currently in South Korea. Um, basically tried to talk to uh, someone who went to enemy country. So uh, North Korea is evil the reason that the government in Pyongyang and doesn't allow the even basic uh, human connection. So, um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Song Min Lee. Uh, since uh, escaping North Korea in 2009 and finding freedom, I had a chance to visit many countries. 
among all the, all the differences I observed, um, three things particularly stood out. No other country forbids its people from leaving, none the field exposing their citizens to the outside world as North Korea does. And no regime seems laundering its history and presents as desperately. And if you go to North Korea and see that their textbooks, the history, what they are teaching, it's uh, different. It's different from the Korean history about the Kim family. Um, so the question here is that why does North Korea go to such a length if the regime were confident in its uh, legitimacy? Why does it isolate its people? I find my answer here, the North Korean regime feels insecure and has much to hide. And not only from the world, but more importantly, from its own citizens. I lived in North Korea for over 20 years, believing everything what government told me, that we lived in a socialist paradise, that our leaders were revered worldwide. Even some absurd tales of them skipping meals and taking naps in moving cars to care for people. Indoctrination, fear, and information control are the North Korean regime's main tool for survival. But the things are changing. Things are changing. Unlike the images we tend to see in North Korean propaganda media, Many North Koreans, especially younger generations today, no longer trust the government lies. External information is trickling in, planting seeds of doubts, and awakening a desire for freedom. Returning overseas North Korean workers exposed to the outside world are questioning the things they are taught in North Korea. At the Human Rights Foundation, where I lead its Korea programs, we support activists and civil society groups working towards for the future for North Koreans. Our partners stay in close touch with people inside North Korea through secret channels. And we hear their voices, voices calling for change, for better life. Recently, um, Recently, we, I received uh, two audio messages from North Korean residents inside the country. So one was talking about the police seizing USBs uh, from the dropped balloons, not to destroy them, to sell in markets. Another woman near the Chinese border requested uh, business uh, educational materials. So these are some of the examples we are currently seeing and uh, the receiving the messages from North Korea. So these stories show that despite the regime's efforts, people are hungry for knowledge and information about the outside world. So we do believe that information is the most powerful tool for change. That's the reason why Human Rights Foundations launched the Flash Drives for Freedom in 2016 and to date, we, we have smuggled over 134,000 USB sticks and SD cards filled with books, documentaries, and news into North Korea in collaboration with local groups, impacting over 1.3 million people. We estimate one uh, USB drive gets shared by uh, about 10 people on average uh, within the family and among the friends. So shared secretly, these memory devices are agents of truth. We cannot afford to slow down. North Korean government lately, uh, we have seen the North Korean government's efforts to isolate its people even further, abandoning reunification policies and fortifying its borders. These are signs of fear, not strength. As the regime raises barriers higher, we must work even harder to reach out to North Koreans with truthful information. An informed population is the uh, regime's greatest fear and nightmare. 
knowledge empowers the people to demand better treatment from their governments, and one day those demands will become impossible to ignore. With your continued support and by working together and support of the international community, uh, we will be bringing uh, this change on uh, one day. Thank you so much. And so, name just briefly to share with us based on your own experience, why access to information? How did this impact your own thinking? What changed? And why do you see access to outside information as a pathway to bring meaningful change in North Korea? How did this affect your thinking? Yeah, um, that's, uh, I could talk about based on my uh, experiences. Um, living in an environment that doesn't have alternative sources of information, basically uh, what now North Korea used to be uh, 10 years ago and uh, 15 years ago when I was there, and uh, we all information you receive just government messages uh, from the TV, radio broadcast, or slogans on the street. So we didn't think about any alternative ideas or thoughts. We all believed what government told us. But um, when I was uh, 13 years old, and I had a chance to watch a South Korean drama that was uh, called Winter Sonata, and it shocked, it, it shocked me, the reason because um, we were taught to believe South Korea is such a poor country, a country there was a lot of uh, kids uh, wandering around dumping ground for food instead of going to school. So we were taught to uh, liberate South Koreans, poor South Koreans, uh, under the bosom, under the leadership of our government. But when I watched that movie, and uh, it was uh, surprising, the movie didn't criticize anything about North Korea. It was showing basically uh, daily lives and having coffee, uh, sipping coffee in the coffee shops and the cars on the street and all the skyscrapers in the background. That was something that just shocked and uh, we started uh, questioning North Korean uh, propaganda. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. I wanna turn for our uh, final testimony to a video message as we previewed from Mr. Takoya of the Association of Families of uh, Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. Turn your attention to the screen, please. ジュエ氏の姿を見るとき、この異様なコントラストが当たり前であって良いのかと単純に思います。彼ら特権階級が住むの家の窓から苦しむ人々の姿は見えないのでしょうか。車で移動する際に窓の外にいる人々の絶望
私たちは親世代が健在なうちに拉致被害者本人と日本で再会することを強く求めています時間的制約がある問題です万が一親世代が健在なうちに再会が果たせないといった事態が起きた場合私たちは対応局面を改め再び制裁強化に軸足を移し日本政府に対し新たな北朝鮮への独自制裁強化を求めます日朝国交正常化に対しても強く反対することになります私たちの要求は全拉致被害者の即時一括帰国です部分的解決や段階的解決は求めていません日朝両国に調査委員会や合同事務所設置も求めていません北朝鮮の時間稼ぎと幕引きの手口に乗ってはなりません北朝鮮政府は厳重な監視下で全拉致被害者の誰がいつどこで何をしているのかを把握しています居場所がわからないということはないのですこうした点を日本政府はじめ各国政府は見誤ることなく北朝鮮と強く外交交渉を進めてほしいと思います国際社会一方的な暴力による現状変更を絶対に許してはなりません日本においては46年前に主権国家に北朝鮮の工作員が侵入し無実の13歳の少女を拉致したまま人質外交を続けています私は声を大にして言います北朝鮮よ姉横田恵を返せ全拉致被害者を速やかに解放せよと拉致問題の解決なくして両国に明るい未来は訪れません金正恩委員長においては過去の代で実行された忌まわしい人権侵害である拉致問題をあなたの手で解決させ明るい未来を手にすることができるよう勇気ある英断をしてほしいと思います娘の金正恩氏に希望の持てる将来を与える決断をしてほしいと思います各国の皆様北朝鮮が拉致問題解決しない限り決して制裁の手を緩めることがないよう改めて結束してくださいそして自分たちの家族や兄弟との再会を願う勇気ある皆様絶対に諦めることなく言葉を武器にして戦い続けましょう私も戦闘で声を上げ続けます必ず勝利を勝ち取りましょう関係ある皆様の力添えに感謝いたします本日はありがとうございます I think you th see from the testimony that you've heard here, this is regime orchestrated policy of abuse and atrocities, and that abuse at home is what seeds the aggressive behavior around the world.、Um, this closes this part of our testimony.、Uh, Des Peters, I'll turn to you. Thank you so much, Damon.、Um, on behalf of the United States, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. Um, we are in awe of your strength, your bravery, your courage in being able to speak out and share your stories. Please know that we and every government around this table will take your testimonies with us moving forward as we work to combat these unspeakable horrors and abuses. So, thank you so much. We are honored and pleased to also be joined today by two of our、uh, leading experts in this space on DPRK human rights. We are so pleased you were able to join us today, and we're going to shift our panel discussion, our testimony component of the panel discussion, to our two experts to lead us in a discussion today. Back over to you, Damon. Thank you so much. Um, it's really my distinct pleasure to introduce two、uh, leading authorities on North Korea. And first, we're going to turn to Dr. Victor Cha,、um, who serves as the president of Geopolitics and Foreign Policy Department and the Korea chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where we'll have an opportunity、uh, to gather later this evening. He's also a distinguished professor at Georgetown University, and he has deep experience in the U.S. Korea relations, having served.、Uh, Where we served alongside each other at the National Security Council as Director for Asian Affairs, playing a key role in shaping U.S. policy toward, towards North Korea during critical、uh, ne negotiations.、Um, he's also someone I have to, in full disclosure, say that I am honored to have serve on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy.、Um, and also with us is Olivia Inis, a, pr a prominent voice in the field of human rights and national security issues in Asia. A senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, 
an adjunct professor in the Democracy and Governments program at Georgetown University. Uh, her work encompasses North Korea, Burma, China, Cambodia, examining issues of democracy and religious freedom. Uh, and prior to this, uh, having worked with the Hong Kong Advocacy Group, senior policy uh, research analyst at, at Heritage Foundation as well. So let's begin, if we may, with uh, Dr. Cha, Victor, to share your latest findings on your research. Well, thank you, uh, Damon, and let me also Thank Deputy Secretary Campbell, Minister Kim, Ambassador Yamada, Ambassador Turner, Das Peters for bringing us all together here today and putting such a focus on this issue, particularly in a trilateral context. Um, and of course, uh, I join the course of appreciation for Justin, Ms. Kwan, and Mr. Lee for um, your, your courage and your testimony and all that you're doing on this particular issue. I'm going to focus on an aspect of North Korean human rights abuses that has pretty much been obscured up until now, uh, and that is how the government has uh, mistreated and neglected its people during the COVID pandemic. North Korea was in a three and a half year COVID lockdown, and until recently, um, as the lockdown has lifted, uh, we've been able to get some insights uh, based on some surveying we've done inside the country. There's a lot of data here that I'm not going to be able to share in the few minutes that I have. So I will just give you sort of the overview and we'll be publishing this work um, in the near future. Um, so if we could go to the, ne the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, period of the survey was at the very end of last year. We did about 100 of these um, and we covered, if, if we go to the next slide, uh, we tried to cover a good part of the population in the different provinces, obviously in the city of Pyongyang, but in Chagang, North Huanghe, North Pyongan, all different provinces. Next slide. Uh, this gives you a sense of the demographics. Um, we had students answering the survey, scientists, party officials, soldiers, uh, business and trade people of different education types, um, about 60% female, 40% male, and across all, uh, all age groups from 18 to 75 years old. I'm going to describe to you five basic findings that came out of the work that we've done, but as I said, there's much more uh, in the data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first finding was that uh, despite North Korea's claim of zero COVID cases until April 2022, uh, COVID-19 infections appeared to be rampant in the country starting in 2020. 92% um, of the people that we talked to said they got or knew of someone who got COVID-19 um, prior to April 2022. The vast majority said that COVID was spreading, quote, like wildfire from 2020, long before the government publicly acknowledged that the virus was in the country. Next slide, please. Second, ordinary North Koreans endured the pandemic largely on their own with minimal access to professional health care, medicine, or vaccines before May 2022 when they went public with the virus being inside the country. Only 13% said they had access to testing. Only 8% said they received a mask from the government. Most of them were forced to make masks on their own out of cloth, and they talked about how they would rewash their masks to use them, which, of course, does not provide any protection whatsoever. Um, after May 2022, when the government announced that they needed help, it appears as though the general public received one shot um, and that the military re received three shots, all, all of Chinese origin. Um, but the other thing that was really horrible to read about was many, there were many reported deaths through the misuse of medicine, scams, fake prescriptions that people tried to take advantage of the desperation of the general population that was getting no help with regard to the, to the virus. Next slide, please. Third finding was that suffering among North Korean people was exacerbated by strict quarantine rules, a worsening food crisis, and extreme punishment for breaking antivirus rules. 97% uh, of the people we talked to said they could not acquire their goods they were needed through the market during the lockdown. 81% said they suffered acute food shortages during the lockdown. And anybody who was found breaking the rules uh, was sent to labor camps for anywhere between two days um, and six months. Next slide, please. Um, access to re reliable information about COVID-19 during the pandemic was severely limited both because of the regime's efforts to only distribute information that served its interests 
and hesitation at the local community to truthfully report cases. So what was happening was that anybody who reported having a fever or sore throat because there was no testing was immediately assumed to have COVID and then that village was locked down. And so what you had was double je what we call double jeopardy, which was the government was providing disinformation about the pandemic and the population, the public was not reporting the pandemic because they did not want to get locked down. So it was a really nasty spiral, a cascade of negative events that only made the situation uh, doubly worse. 64% um, said they didn't trust information coming from the government. And interestingly, only a minority saw this conspiracy theory that somehow the virus was a US or South Korean weapon. Uh, only a minority of people said they believe that view. Finally, next slide please. Finally, uh, many respondents um, expressed resentment towards the government's handling of the pandemic and a willingness to circumvent quarantine rules through bribery, revealing new areas of vulnerability for the regime. Um, if you go to the next slide, these are some of the statements that we recorded from people about their views on the, on the pandemic. I won't read them. I'll just say that uh, as we have read, um, autocratic regimes use the pandemic to crack down on liberty of their populations. And that was the case in North Korea, including cracking down on markets. Um, but the way in which they did not do anything for their population actually created new resistance and new vulnerabilities in the regime, um, the residual effects that I, which, of which I think are still very salient today. Um, so thank you for your attention and uh, Damon, thanks for the, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Victor. Olivia, please. It's an honor to be here today. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the US Department of State and the governments of both Korea and Japan for hosting this momentous event. This is a critical opportunity to provide a platform for the incredible survivors of the Kim regime's brutality to share their stories of resilience. But it's also an opportunity for us, um, for all of our governments, to take stock of what has been accomplished when it comes to tackling the North Korean human rights challenge, but also what is yet to be done. The timing of this event is not lost on me. Um, today marks 20 years since the North Korean Human Rights Act was signed into law. The act is landmark legislation that created, of course, um, the special envoy for North Korean human rights issues, um, pathways for North Koreans to find refuge here in the US, as well as support for organizations providing access to information to the North Korean people, which often serves as a critical lifeline, as we've heard on this panel. This year also marks 10 years since the seminal United Nations Commission of Inquiry report was released. Perhaps no report has raised greater awareness about the plight of the North Korean people or crystallized the nature of the crimes that the Kim regime has committed and the North Korean people face. Human rights violations that the commission says were without parallel in the modern world, and these are not merely historical, these are ongoing crimes against humanity. Both the COI and the North Korean Human Rights Act sparked incredible action over the last several years. Um, in the wake of the COI, our ally and friend South Korea passed their own North Korean Human Rights Act. We saw Kim Jong-un and other top party officials um, sanctioned on human rights grounds for the very first time. Even Congress was at work with the North Korean Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act, which for the first time tied sanctions relief to North Korea to forward progress on human rights issues, not merely on security issues. We also saw Congress pass the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, which created a rebuttable presumption that all goods produced with North Korean forced labor, North Korean labor are believed to be produced with forced labor and therefore barred entry to the US. And this last one is probably my favorite. More than 200 North Korean refugees have found freedom as refugees here in the United States. The momentum generated by both the North Korean Human Rights Act and the Commission of Inquiry report are not lost on me. However, in recent years, efforts to prioritize North Korean human rights have largely stalled. 
There is a real need to breathe new life into these efforts and to put the North Korean people and their rights first, even and especially when the Kim regime refuses to do so. One of the most promising ways to put North Korean human rights issues at the center is for the US government to issue an atrocity determination of its own, stating whether the North Korean people face ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity. An atrocity determination can be made at the discretion of the Secretary of State. It can be made at any point in time, and it is one of the most powerful tools that the US government has in its toolbox. An atrocity determination doesn't merely call a spade a spade or just raise awareness. It generates momentum and action that leads to results. We can have confidence in this because if past is prologue, we know that atrocity determinations lead to action. This was the case of the Uyghur atrocity determination issued under the previous administration, which led US Congress to pass one of the most important acts on Uyghur human rights, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. The same was true for the Rohingya atrocity determination issued by the Biden administration, which led to the sanctioning of key officials and cutting off the Burmese military from critical lines of resources. And if we look even further back in history at the ISIS atrocity determination for Yazidis and Shiite Muslims um, under the Obama administration, it led to a creation of a fund for survivors of these atrocities under the next administration, the Trump administration. Atrocity determinations create legacies. They also transcend parties and even branches of government. They're a unifying force for action and something that the North Korean people today need arguably more than ever. While my own research and work at Hudson Institute suggests that the North Korean people, especially North Korean people, North Korean Christians, may face ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity, a determination of crimes against humanity would be equally powerful, especially considering that there is no hierarchy of atrocity crimes. The question remains, why now? I believe an atrocity determination now has the potential to spur action in Congress to defend the North Korean people and their rights. I started off my comments by noting that the North Korean Human Rights Act is 20 years old today, but it's lapsed since September of 2022, and I believe an atrocity determination now might spark Congress to act. I also believe that now, 10 years after the COI, as the United Nations undertakes um, an update to the COI, which is slated to be released in September of next year, we can amplify global efforts to shine a spotlight on the plight of the North Korean people. The North Korean people continue to suffer today because of the Kim regime's brutality. This is especially true post-pandemic, as we just heard uh, from my esteemed colleague, Victor Cha, where the North Korean people have been cut off from critical lifelines like access to the informal economy. The Kim regime continues its grotesque policies of public purges and public executions. And today, three generations of a family can still be sent to political prison camps for the so-called sins of one. This level of degradation, this level of brutality must be met with a strong response from the US and from our friends and our allies. Issuing an atrocity determination is one of the most powerful means the US has at its disposal to elevate and improve responses to atrocity crimes. We would, of course, love to see allies like South Korea and Japan join us in issuing similar atrocity determinations. And genuinely, it is our shared hope that one day the North Korean people would know true freedom as we do in our own countries. Issuing an, an atrocity determination and taking concerted action to defend the North Korean people's human rights is the next best shot we have at remedying and responding to their plight. Thank you. Thank you so much both. And again, thank you to Damon uh, for so eloquently moderating yes. our panel today. Let's give all of our panelists another round of applause. <laughs> Next, we will hear from some of the countries gathered around the table and short interventions. 
You may be familiar with the style of intervention from the UN Human Rights Council sessions and the Universal Periodic Review, where countries can make uh, voluntary pledges to protect and promote human rights and pressure our government to act. We will see this on display in Geneva on November 7th when the DPRK is up for its Universal Periodic Review. These interventions will be kept very short, so we're giving countries one minute today for their interventions. We'll start with interventions by the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan in that order, followed by other representatives in alphabetical order. I would like to now invite my friend and partner, Ambassador Turner, our special envoy for North Korean human rights issues to give the United States intervention. Over to you, Julie. Thank you, Das Peters. Please don't cut off my mic if I go over my time. <laughs> just that. kidding. Um, I, I just want to echo the thanks and the praise to the panelists, um, particularly our escapee guests who just courageously shared your stories. I thank you um, and hope that we do your stories justice by helping to provide a platform to amplify um, your stories and testimonies. And thank you to Olivia and Victor for your insights and analysis. The US remains committed to a survivor-centered approach to accountability, um, in particular providing opportunities like the one today for truth-telling by survivors. We are also committed to continuing our efforts to document the ongoing egregious human rights violations and abuses committed by the North Korean government to hold for future criminal accountability purposes. We also support continued efforts to advance access to information. And so I appreciate the stories shared today that emphasize the impact that those information efforts have inside North Korea. And we are continuing to think through innovative and creative ways that we can further those dissemination efforts. Um, as Olivia pointed out, it is the 20th anniversary of the US North Korean Human Rights Act, the 20th anniversary of my position today. Um, but I want to also reaffirm the pieces of that act that established a US resettlement program for North Koreans. Um, earlier today, we met with many of the civil society representatives in this room to announce a Friends for Future resource sharing network to um, offer more support to the North Korean refugees that are living here in the United States. I also want to underscore our commitment to the immediate resolution of the abductees, detainees, and unrepatriated POWs and divided families issues. For so many families in the ROK, in Japan, in the United States, and in other places around the world, these individuals have been separated from their loved ones for far too long. My takeaway from today um, is that there is an urgency and an imperative to act. And I hope that those of us in the room on the civil society side, as well as the governments around the table, will rise to that challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Turner. I would like to now give the floor to the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Uh, today, we have heard a vivid voice revealing the harsh realities of human rights in North Korea. Uh, despite the significant effort of international community and NGOs and expert groups, the oppression and control of the North Korean regime persists. As marketization spread of outside information gradually uh, take place within North Korea, the country is slowly changing from below. Even under the regime's suppression and control, outside information continue to flow in, and with it, the consciousness of North Korean people is evolving. Our unwavering attention and effort are becoming a ray of hope that reaches even the most closed of place on us. Our steadfast solidarity will inspire the North Korean people to yearn for freedom and human rights, ultimately driving change within North Korea. I urge you to continue listening to the voice of North Korean human rights victims around the world and to amplify 
their voice, working uh, tirelessly to promote human rights in North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Republic of Korea. I'd now like to give the floor to Japan. Thank you. I'd like to join others to thank the panelists uh, today for their courageous uh, testimony. Uh, sharing their own experiences and heartbreaking accounts on North Korea's human rights violations. And it is important for the international community to continue to send a clear and strong message to North Korea, as we are doing through today's meeting, calling for improvements in human rights situation in North Korea and urging North Korea to take concrete actions. Also, we would like to ask uh, for your continuous understanding and cooperation toward the immediate resolution of the abductions issue by North Korea. So uh, finally, let me thank uh, the United States again uh, for providing this opportunity to gather and highlight the human rights situation as well as abuses in North Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Japan. I'd now like to give the floor to Germany. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'd like to associate myself and with the thanks uh, for organizing this um, uh, crucial event. I struggle a bit to um, follow such, um, such impressive testimony with sort of diplomatic remarks, so I'm going to try and sort of speak from the impressions that, that, that I gained. Um, maybe three observations. The first is, I think, in case we didn't know before, we know now that the DPRK has one of the most horrific human rights records of any place in the world, um, and we must call it uh, as we see it. Um, and we must use the instruments that we have at our disposal, and we have some instruments. You know, we have, for example, the European Union has the human rights sanctions regime, which we have brought to bear uh, on North Korea, and I hope that in the next round of discussions for this instrument that we can um, be more forceful. Um, the second observation that I had is, sounds a bit obvious, but bears repeating, human rights are not something that are imposed by any one place or any one country or any one ideology. They are universal, uh, and we must defend them as such. Um, I hope that um, all the countries around this table and beyond use the U Universal Periodic Review at the Human Rights Council um, to find clear words on this. And thirdly, and maybe most crucially, um, there is nothing more important than um, listening to and amplifying the voices of human rights defenders, um, such as the brave individuals we have here, particularly in countries like North Korea that are so hermetically sealed off that make it very, very difficult for even the most committed country to do human rights projects in country, supporting people like we have on this panel amplifying their voices, giving them resources and networking and funding is so crucial. Um, I can speak for Germany when I say that we, you know, we fund uh, one project on a sexual uh, violence and gender-based violence in North Korea, um, but we must do more to support exile and dissident communities that have been able to leave the country um, because they are the most important voices. And we know from other contexts that those are the individuals that will one day lead North Korea into freedom. May that day come very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Germany. And finally, I'd like to give the floor to Sweden. Thank you. And let me also begin by expressing my admiration for those that have testified here today. And then let me speak for Sweden, but with a personal touch. I served as the ambassador of Sweden to DPRK between 2017 and 2019. When people hear about this, the most common reaction that I get is, what, can you really live there? And the answer is yes. DPRK is a real country, and more importantly, and moreover, as we have heard here today, real people are living and suffering there. The people that I met in DPRK, I found to be friendly, warm-hearted, and caring, but also people that we have heard here whose existence has been shaped and limited by a totalitarian state to the extent that they have been forced to suppress many of the qualities that make us human. Curiosity, critical and independent thinking, the quest for personal purpose and meaning. Life was there, but to paraphrase the American Constitution, 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness was not. I cannot personally testify to public executions, labor camps, or physical torture, as I never saw any of it. But just as a black hole in space cannot be seen, but still sensed through the way it affects its surroundings, I sensed the weight of the regime in my daily interactions with North Koreans. Their awkward silences, the worried looks and nervousness when I brought up certain issues. Their fear of the heat during the summer and the cold during the winter due to lack of proper housing and what it could mean for their crops. Their agony over a sick child, knowing there was nothing they could do for it. The way they ate their hearts out when I took them out for dinner. The way they fretted the lean season every spring when food stocks were low and starvation just a failed harvest away. The way they displayed emotions when we visited a Buddhist temple or when they were given the chance to sing karaoke to old Korean songs. The way they smiled when I got finally the permission to take some of them on their first trip of their lives outside Pyongyang. So human rights are systematically violated in DPRK. The perpetrator should be held accountable and Sweden would support any action in that endeavor. But let us not forget the victims, some of them that we have heard from here today. People that have been deprived of their rights and dignity and who dare not wish for a better life, sometimes even in their own dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sweden, and thank you for the reminder about the continued need for us to center the victims in all the work that we do to tackle the DPRK's human rights abuses. I want to thank you all around the table for joining us today and for your interventions. The diversity of the countries that we have around this table really speaks to our joint resolve to tackle these human rights abuses, and we're grateful for you joining us. And with that, I'd like to introduce our Assistant Secretary of our Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, Daphna Rand, here at the State Department for our closing remarks. Thank you, distinguished guests, panelists, attendees. Thank you to our Deputy Secretary for sticking around and being with us as we hear these interventions. I, too, feel like you can't read from diplomatic ease when you've heard these stories of human life, when you've heard these powerful, powerful, analytic, academic, and personal assessments of what we should be doing, the calls of action, even in the past hour, that have come from this room, and the ideas for um, diplomatic sanctions and other forms of accountability are deeply powerful. So thank you um, to everyone who has spent um, time with us here at the State Department. We are concluding and this moving and powerful open session on the DPRK human rights. And there are so many people who have made it possible. So I just want to first thank the individuals um, who behind the scenes have worked so hard to make it possible. And I do think they are owed a cup. <laughs> to our brave survivors, you have made us all who like to talk a lot for a living very, very speechless. Um, and that's just uh, because of your courage that is truly inspiring. To the members of the divided families, including the family members of the Japanese abductees, your unwavering dedication to seeking justice and reunification is deeply moving. And many of us were at a side event at the United Nations last month uh, where there was story upon story told about the implications and ramifications for generations of the divided families. And so I just want to again call out these families for again and again telling their stories and, and really raising attention to the, to the impact. Um, I also want to talk about the ideas that came out of today and the follow-up. We believe in the State Department that we meet and we talk and we exchange ideas, but we then have do-outs. We have follow-up, and I want to recognize that the just trilateral diplomatic convening, this partnership between the U.S., the Republic of Korea, and Japan is a powerful force for good. Um, so thank you for this multilateral collaboration. Each and every one of you, the audience members, some, some of you are real experts.
experts on DPRK human rights issues, you're civil society activists, you've dedicated your lives to it. Some of you are coming today for the first time and learning about uh, the tragedy and essentially uh, the devastation that the regime has wrought on its people. So I want to thank both groups, those who have dedicated their careers and their lives to this issue and those that are trying to learn and seek new information. Thank you for being here. It has been 10 years since the UN Commission of Inquiry's report on human rights on the DPRK. And as we've heard today, the human rights situation has, de has deteriorated even since the COI. We are eagerly awaiting the follow-on report to the COA that is required as part of the Human Rights Council resolution earlier this year. Today is also, as we've just heard, the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-North Korea Human Rights Act, and we thank Ambassador Turner, Julie, for living up to, the, uh, to our congressional intent every day for your work here. This act authorized our activities to promote human rights in North, in North Korea, activities that we are still supporting and growing and building on 20 years later. So I'm very proud that our Congress saw how important this issue was 20 years ago, and we are trying every day to bring this law and implement it here at the State Department and across the U.S. government. So let me go back to the ideas that have been raised here today for action. We have heard about raising global awareness about the human rights situation. We have talked very specifically about some of the naming and shaming, uh, the naming and awareness raising that leads to actual effects. So I do want to make sure we capture some of the ideas here that have been raised about public diplomacy. Uh, there are ideas that have been raised today about how to tangibly support the survivors and their families, both for its own sake, because these are individuals and communities that have been deeply traumatized, but also as a means of accountability to help these families seek justice. And then we have heard ideas to strengthen international cooperation around the globe. We've heard about ideas through the EU and its sanctioning abilities and other ideas about how we think of new configurations of new multilateral convenings that could share ideas and could actually maybe uh, force multiply each other's human rights actions. So what I propose here as the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights is we don't let this conference and these ideas end here, but we continue to build concrete actions that we've heard today and move them forward. The road ahead is challenging and the stories today should be a call to action to all of us. There's an urgency to this. Let us leave this session with a renewed sense of purpose and commitment to advancing human rights and accountability in North Korea. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation and your dedication for this crucial cause. Um, and now I'm standing between you and a reception that is being hosted by our colleagues at CSIS at the Center for Strategic and International Studies starting quite soon at 5.30, from 5.30 to 7.30. The exhibit will feature the artwork of North Korean escapee artists, including a guitarist who's performing live, as well as devices that are used by North Koreans inside the DPRK to access information and a collection of DPRK literature and memoirs that highlight the DPRK's human rights record. So this is a celebration of the ingenuity, a celebration of the spirit of the North Korean people who are living amid this um, untenable situation that we've talked about today, but what we want to do at the reception in partnership with CSIS is really celebrate the resilience of spirit, um, the artistic spirit, and the, the voice as it has been able to be amplified of the North Korean people whom we honor and respect and we show our solidarity to. So with that, thank you so much and we are uh, officially closing this convening. Thank you so much.